Welcome to Conversations with Composers. My name is Patricio Molina, director of the conservatory at the Newark School of the Arts. I am a composer and also the co-host to these conversations. Other co-hosts will join us during this series, including Nadine Herman, artistic director, and Larry Tamburi, executive director at the Newark School of the Arts. Each Sunday at 3 p.m., we will bring you a conversation with a diverse range of composers that are very active today. During these interviews, we will learn about their lives and dive closer into some of their music and talk about what fuels their creativity. Today, we speak with Robert Aldrich, Grammy Award winner composer for his opera Elmer, Elmer Grant Gantry. The recording of this work is published by Naxos series American Opera Classics. In today's conversation, we talk, among other topics, about what it means for the composer to win a Grammy Award, how the pandemic affected his writing, and current and future projects to look out for. We begin with an excerpt of Aldridge's Piano Concerto No. 2 with resident conductor Ken Lamb leading the Braveheart Sinfonia with BMC piano faculty member Jihi Chang in the world premiere of Piano Concerto No. 2. Welcome, Dr. Aldrich. Patricia, Larry, great to see you. Good to see you too. So the first question, uh, Dr. Aldrich, uh, how, what was it like winning the Grammy? <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a lot of fun. I didn't um, know that much about it, uh, you know, and uh, one night it was the Grammy was for my opera, first opera, Elmer Gantry. <laughs> from my collaborator, Herschel Garfine, who did the libretto for it. And um, like late one night around Thanksgiving, he said, hey, we've been nominated for a Grammy, you know, because what happens is, you know, there are hundreds of people on the 
bidder nominates themselves or somebody else nominates them. Um, we had a recording put out of Elmer Gantry that was done in 2011, and then it got on the Grammy ballot. And then um, they narrow it down to five. Each category narrows down to five. So you go, it goes from several hundred in each category down to five. So that's like being nominated is already like a, a big thing because, um, and then you go, that to win one, you have to be chosen from the five. Um, so it was, I, I didn't know anything about it. And I um, joined, it's the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences known as NARIS. And they're the ones that sponsor the Grammy each year. And it's usually in, it used to alternate between Los Angeles and New York, but it, now it's mostly in Los Angeles. So, uh, and I, I didn't really want to go to the Grammy, but, but my daughter talked me into it because uh, she was about 13 or 14 at the time. So she wanted to see all the pop stars and, you know, and see the, be on the red carpet. So we went and then Herschel took his daughter who was a little younger, I guess um, my daughter was about 15 or 16 and, and Herschel's daughter was about 12. So we went, the four of us went out and that was a lot of fun. So it you, you kind of, you know, without any expectations for winning and Herschel would say, look, you bet, do you have your speech ready? And I said, well, no, we're not gonna win. He said, you gotta write your speech. So he kept after me um, and, uh, you know, so they're reading names and, you know, you go to the, the, the Grammys for everything, but the few pop awards are in the evening, but the majority of the Grammys are given out at night. I mean, the afternoon. And that's where, you know, your fellow musicians and producers and everybody goes. So that's a very cool thing because it's not this, you know, loud music playing and whatever. It's, it's um, a kind of a much more relaxed environment. Um, and the, um, who was the uh, female bass player, jazz bass player, who's really become prominent. She announced our category and we, you know, and uh, and when she said our names and we had won for Elmer Gantry, uh, you know, my daughter said, you've won. And I was <laughs> like, I was like, if there was that moment of kind of unreality, like what? <laughs> and the next thing you know, you're walking up and, um, and they hand you the a, a Grammy that's not going to be yours. As soon as you get off stage, they take it away from you. But you know, it's a kind of a dummy Grammy that they have. And then the you know what was a lot of fun is they take you and the four of us went around to all these press interviews and um, you know this kind of cascade of photo photo sessions. Uh, you know for a couple of hours, it seemed like we were running around the gauntlet but doing a lot of things. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And um, including like rooms full of reporters, arts reporters. And um, so one person asked me, so do you feel like the opera is still relevant to today's time since, you know, why, why are you writing an opera when it's really about pop music? And I said, well, <laughs> so I kind of got a little bit upset and I said, look, opera is the high water mark of civilization at, you know, I don't think pop music is the high water mark of civilization, but opera, which combines music, words, design, you know, uh, everything, the voice. So I, I went, I went on a kind of a tear about the history of opera. <laughs> was, was it Esper, was it Esperanza, Esperanza Spalding? Yes, it was. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's great. Yeah. She won the year before. She won like best new artist of the year. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So I guess they have pretty been... amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was great. Um, now uh, writing, writing an opera is uh, hours and hours of music. I'm sure you hit a wall at some point. So, what do you do to to for creativity to inspire yourself? Well, you need a great story, you know. First of all, and. Uh, you know, that I had always thought that my first opera, Elmer Gantry, I had had the idea years before because I hadn't read the book, but I saw the movie with Burt Lancaster, which is a very, was a famous movie at the time. And I thought, you know, I'm a son of a minister and he uh, grew up in the South, and, you know, as a, originally as a Southern Baptist. So 
I had a great interest in religion, you know, subjects of faith and religion. And so I always thought Elmer Gantry would be a great idea for an opera. And uh, we kind of got into it. I asked Herschel if he would do the libretto. He's also a composer, but he had a lot of experience in the theater. So I, um, you know, we started working. The, um, the worst thing you could do in writing an opera is starting at the beginning. You don't want to do that. Um, you want to try to find, you know, as they say, the expression, uh, pick the low hanging fruit. That is the things that you know are going to be in the opera, but aren't the hardest things like the entrance of a main character, right? That's going to be, you know, you have to you pretty much have to have an aria for that kind of thing. Um, the entrance for the, uh, other so when we had two main characters so we we worked on their entrance entrances to the opera which weren't at the beginning so um so then you kind of just compile everything you sort of work backwards work forwards but you 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 don't write in a linear fashion or at least we didn't and i don't recommend it because then because if you go back to the first scene once you've written all these other things, you know where you're going and you can use motives and all kinds of things that you, you know are going to be later in the beginning, right? So you already have, yeah. you, can, you, know, you can learn a lot from where you're going by doing where you're going first, then coming back to the opening. Well, well that kind of also brings us to the topic that you have a background in literature. And so how did you go from that love of literature into music? Well, yes, yeah, I was a very late bloomer in music. I was, I always played um, guitar as a kid, and uh, I was an English major in college. But then when my junior year, I took a song, right, a composition for non-majors, which almost every university has. There's, a, they, um, you know, when people take the class and learn about composing, even though you're not a major, so... It was, it was sort of like the light went off over my head as soon as I started writing music. So it, so I took as many music courses in my last couple of years at college as I, I couldn't get enough credits to be a major, but um, I knew that my path was going to be in, co in composing. And I went home and told my parents, I want to be a composer. And they said, <laughs> they said well, how are you going to... Uh, make money doing that and uh, well, that's another good question how do you make money being a composer uh you teach <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean that's one of the interesting questions um you know there are lots of ways to make money as a composer but there are very few classical or concert music composers who support themselves fully i'd say philip glass john adams very few you could probably count the number who don't you know, who um, support themselves completely by their own work on one hand or maybe maximum two hands. Um, you know, you, uh, you get commissioned, you know, to write pieces and um, hopefully you get paid for those commissions. Then um, there are royalties, performance royalties from BMI and ASCAP. And then there are recording royalties when you have pieces recorded or played on the radio or published deep music. So, you know, there are a lot of, as, as my, lo my entertainment lawyer once said, he's never seen so many streams of revenue coming from music as other fields. So, you know, when it's art, you basically sell a painting or like, you know, it's very... It, there's a lot of it's a lot of money for a painting but with music it's more like a lot of revenue streams from a lot of different places so mm -hmm. uh, usually adding up to not enough to support yourself which is why <laughs> most of us teach but you know in, in in my best years i've done pretty well where there's an opera commission or uh when i got um, you know when we did an oratorio in 2010 it was the commission was over a hundred thousand dollars for that was for me and Herschel, but it you know it can get quite if someone really wants you to do a, a big piece, it's there can be a fair amount of money involved. Otherwise, it's not you know I wouldn't recommend it if you're thinking of, of getting rich as a composer, unless you're doing film music or you know um, that kind of thing. So uh, 
Has the uh, pandemic affected you as a composer? Uh, yeah, it has. I mean, at first you would think that having all this time and not having to commute down, I live in Montclair and it's about a 45 minute commute down to New Brunswick at Rutgers University. Uh, but you think having all this additional time, you're at home and you, you know, uh, you're not going anywhere and uh, that you, that you would just naturally be inspired to write, but more, you know, I've talked to a number of people that took them a couple of months to kind of get, you know, of being completely, I didn't write anything, you know, from about March and April. Um, and then I did the way that I, you know, everybody was saying, okay, we're going to write a solo pieces because th those could be performed and I didn't want to do that. So I did the most impractical thing that a composer can do at this day and age during the pandemic. I started my first symphony and that's what got me going. Cause I, you know, I've written operas, I've written oratorios, I've written concertos, um, I've written overtures, but I've never wrote a symphony. So that was, uh, and that's about the most impractical thing you could do now because, you know, uh, I always tell the composers, most orchestras have, you know, a, go off the model of an overture or you know a 10 minute five to ten minute opening piece a concerto uh with the you know a, a virtuoso that your orchestra can afford you know the most your orchestra can afford to play and then the second half is a war horse symphony right so i tell my students where do you think you're going to be in that model you think they're going to give you the second half of a concert uh, no, no way, you know, so I've been first on the concert and I've had concerti played, luckily enough. But, um, you know, the, the thing is, is ultimately be on the second half of the program. It's a hard, that's very hard because, you know, people are coming to hear a Beethoven symphony or a Mahler symphony. They don't necessarily want to hear an Aldridge symphony in the second half. So, yeah. So that's um, that's the reality of the business, but I'm very happy. So now I'm working very well. And uh, if impractically on my first symphony, I figure, you know, got to do it. Now that's pretty exciting. We could have, an, when you write it, then you could have an Aldrich concert too. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's right. Aldrich Overture, Aldrich Concerto, Aldrich Second Half. I, I don't know who would come to that, but. You could even put in some arias. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, yes. We just run a concert like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the, that orchestra would go bankrupt the next day. <laughs> but we'll have fun while it lasts. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dr. Aldrich, um, students, young students that want to uh, go to college as composers, what do they need for their application? Um, normally, we ask for the undergrad level, we ask for three pieces um, of contrasting nature. Um, and sometimes we get composers who haven't done that much or they've written pop songs or they've written, uh, you know, and sometimes you get people that have done a lot. So we, you know, so we get, we have all types. In fact, we've got like 20 or more undergrads in our composition program at Rutgers of all different variety of styles you know some much more pop oriented some very classical oriented some more avant-garde some more traditional so well i like the fact that there's an eclectic mix of composers and patricia you being there you knew you saw that mix of a lot of different styles um and uh, appreciate that so we usually ask for three pieces and even if they're not that you know, advanced, if we see potential, we accept them, you know, because not, there aren't that many, you know, while a 17 year old student can be a, a, a virtuoso on piano, as you were, Patricio, um, you know, uh, very few people have, have advanced, are advanced in composition at 17. It's just, you know, uh, generally a lot of people at Rutgers uh, and when I was at Montclair State, they they got to school majoring in something else, and then they thought it was cool that the composers were having their music play, and then all of a sudden became a double major or switched to composition, but they didn't do it before that. So you know, um, did you write? Did you compose earlier, Patricio? 
Uh, yeah, here and there, um, you know, I, I, I always composed, you know, even when I was five or six years old, but never, you know, never uh, full time. So right, I taking it seriously during my master's year, uh, you know, in college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, right, I remember when I met you at the a fundraiser for the... Mm -hmm. <laughs> right for the Newark School of the Arts. Was the That's right. A couple of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's more like seven or eight, like, right? It was like seven or eight years ago. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And Patricia was uh that was that was quite a quite a big deal <laughs> meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Well you came up to me and said, Hey, I want to come come and study with you. So that was great. You, look at this, uh, almost done with the PhD now. So <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah, you're going to be done uh, in a month or so, right? Yeah, yeah. hopefully. We'll see. <laughs> this, uh, you, uh, Larry, you've got to hear this piece. It's great. Oh, good. I look forward to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. You should play it for Larry. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You're a great yeah. teacher. You're a great teacher. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Bob, I have a question. When you're just relaxing, <laughs> what kind of music do you like to listen to? Who do you listen to? Oh, well, I, you know... <laughs> all kinds but uh, uh my wife teases me because when it, when i cook which is two or three times a week i usually i usually put on we have alexa in the in the kitchen and so mm -hmm. um i listen to a lot of van morrison you know because i grew up with his music and love it mm -hmm. and it's very you know it's not complex or i mean I, we listen to jazz too and all kinds of things but it's it's more you know more the pop things in the, you know, just just uh, otherwise, if it's a complex, if the music is inter too interesting or complex, then your mind kind of tries to, you know, if you're a composer, you're always anytime music is playing, you're trying to figure out how it's working. Mm -hmm. You know, like being a car mechanic, you know, always figuring out how the car works and what you know, get your get your head under the hood. But uh, composer is the same way. You know, music when I hear it, you know. Like, what is that? How, you know, mm -hmm. how's it working? So I like to turn that side off when I'm relaxed, mm -hmm. you know, so that, um, and listen to something that I can just, you know, enjoy. Yeah. Do you listen to music when you cook, Larry? Yeah, I've been cooking three days a week too. Yeah. And right. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel really good. I'm starting to get some skills, which is really fun. Yeah. Yeah, I usually listen to chamber music or jazz. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. See, that's too interesting for me. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I have two ways of listening. If I'm seriously listening, I just like filter everything out and just listen. Yeah. You know, which is different than, you know, just being relaxed. Definitely. Yeah. And I never, I never in my whole life got into pop music. I don't even know anything in pop music. And so I just have no connection to it whatsoever. I've yeah. always, I started, I was listening to jazz and classical music my whole life, and that's all I really know, yeah. Wait, like, you know, so in my generation, um, I, I think we're in the same not, generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, but like, so for instance, the Beatles, you know, yeah. they probably, they, you were probably a little too, no, you're what, three or four years older than I am? Yeah, yeah, I never liked the Beatles, I never really, really liked them at all. Yeah, yeah see, you, I was I got into all of that thing, Bob. Yeah. Beatles, you know, uh, yeah. and so I mean there was a, that was my way in initially. But then uh, you know my mother was a big classical music fan, so I would, yeah. and I didn't distinguish between these different things. And then eventually yeah. jazz and rock, and so I think that's one of the reasons I became, you know, I loved it all, and so and wanted to kind of, you know, use. I still think I use parts of a lot of types of music in my own composition. Would you say that? that yeah, sorry. So would you say that that's the the uh, the American sound? Because your your music is uh, distinctly American. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I want it that way, right? Because uh, I mean, if if we're because we're American composers, I think for too long Americans look to Europe to sort of guide the way. And when you think about literature, American literature, they broke away in the 1800s mm -hmm. with Nathaniel Hawthorne, Mark Twain, Herman Melville in the arts. 
in the visual arts, it was in the 20s and 30s, um, you know, with the abstract expressionists. And, uh, you know, but it didn't happen in music until really, I would say, uh, I mean, Copeland certainly and Gershwin were great American composers, but they, not a lot of people followed them, you know. Uh, I've been listening to the Romantic Symphony by Howard Hansen a lot. That was written in the early 30s. Very American sounding too. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a great piece. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, there was an American. There were a lot of those composers that were very good. And yeah. And then the serialists came in and kind of took over everything. Yeah. And the American sound went away. I remember when I was in school for at the Conservatory, Copeland was considered very square, and you know. Yeah. Uh, that you couldn't do that because it was uh, everything was twelve tone and the know, audiences went away too when that when the well twelve tone came in the audiences went away too unfortunately right. <laughs> right that was and that was really problematic because yeah and because once you lose an audience it's hard to get them back as you know mm -hmm. you know and, um, so that was really uh, unfortunate but yeah so I'm I'm happy to see that American music has is continue to define itself and I'm happy to be in that tradition, you know, yeah. of, and I don't know what, uh, you know, if you say what makes American music, I mean, you'd all have different answers. Um, I mean, I think f for me, it's a lot about the rhythm, you know, of the syncopation, right. Mm -hmm. But because that comes from jazz that comes from, you know, Oh. And, and that's your music, the syncopation is so uh, prominent, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the opening of your opera, I love the uh, the third movement of your piano trio. It's just uh, that sometimes the piano has those uh, bass uh, figurations with full of uh, uh, syncopation everywhere. And, you know, that that uh, makes it sound very American. Yeah. yeah. And Patricio is played by music. That trio, which is one of my hardest pieces, most difficult pieces, and Patricia, you know, said I got a call from my publisher saying this uh, student wants to perform your trio, you know, <laughs> and uh, you got the music from Peters, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. That was before we really knew each other. And the music is is super difficult, but it's uh, you know it's it's um, satisfying to practice. This is great music. But I remember practicing a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. I mean, that's that really. I, I think I told the my representative at Peters, wish him good luck when he said, you know, <laughs> because it's really hard. Thank you for watching. Next Sunday at 3 p.m., we will talk with composer Laurie Lightman. Subscribe to our New York School of the Arts YouTube channel to hear upcoming concert talks with Jimmy Roberts, Valerie Capers, Derek Vermel, Hannibal Lacumbe, Thomas Lee, Laurie Lightman, and Dalit Warshaw. <laughs>